Good evening and welcome to the Metaphysical Bible Hangout. I'm Reverend Sherry James and I am the Senior Minister for Understanding Principles in Inglewood, California. We are in a dynamic series called Your Faith is Your Fortune. We are working from the text Your Faith is Your Fortune by Neville Goddard. This is a powerful text. Just absolutely love it. Like it just make you snap your neck back. It's powerful. Actually, I know that's what Gloria Maybanks does. It's like it's a powerful text. The the chapter that we're working from is called The Breath of God. And the question is, do you know the secret to resurrect your dreams? Do you know the secret to resurrect your dreams? That is our conversation tonight. I'm getting my blog post together. Hold on. And I want to give you seven simple steps, seven simple steps. So that's where we're going to focus tonight. I've got a few announcements, opening prayer. We're going to talk about how many times, how many times must I forgive? How many times must I resurrect these dreams? And then we're going to look at seven, seven simple steps to resurrect your dream, dreams and then Q&A. And of course, please ask questions throughout because that helps this process it makes it organic and i want to give you what it is that you need in order to thrive in order to grow that's my prayer for you this evening got a comment ray says have you had a chance to think through psychological versus metaphysical interpretation yes and i think i'll i'll deal with that tonight i wanted to do it as a separate post and do a separate video and that's coming so I'll deal with that tonight because it, it's going to come up when we're talking about classic metaphysical interpretation. I think it's important to know why you do what you do. And I always want you to know why I'm here. And I think it's so important. I was listening to a talk from Oprah a couple of days ago, and I think I posted it on Facebook. And she talked about learning the importance of intention, that you have to have a clear intention when you're going into anything and when when she really got it and what influenced her was Gary Zukov's The Seat of the Soul that you, you have to be clear on what your intention is and she changed the way that she did everything and when producers would come in and pitch her on a show she would ask the question what is your intention and and even with her guests she would ask her guests what is your intention because she wanted to make sure that what was her intention and what was their intention were in alignment. And so my intention is to awaken you to your divine nature. My intention is to connect you to who you really are. And the movie that I always reference, because I just love this movie, we did it for metaphysical movie night at Up Church, is the movie Inception. It's written and directed by Christopher Nolan. I, I, I was thinking today, if I could find a way to put a little X over the gun, <laughs> because I don't, I'm not trying to do this with a gun. But what I do want to do is to give you an idea that you take into yourself and that that idea revolutionizes who you think you are. And that idea is that you are not simply human, that you are divine and the primary part of you is divine. That you are divine first and then human. That you are divine first and then human. And what it means to have that idea take root in you and land in you. That's an exciting world for me because you're talking about people who are walking in their purpose, who are operating in their gift and in their gifting. The Bible hangout is always free, but if you want to bless this, if you want to see me take this all over the world, you see some of the work I'm doing. I shared before I started the recording, I'm working on the logo and new branding. If you are interested in helping me get this message around the world, consider making a gift. You can do that right at revsherry.com. I thank you in advance for any support you decide to give. But I also will make one request. Will you share this with someone? That's the only way that this thing gets around. If you think about most of the things that you have in your experience, they're there because somebody said, hey, Ray, try this out. Or hey, Constance, try this out. And so I would ask, even if you decide not to make a gift, if you would decide to share this with someone that you know that this would bless. And let's see if we can begin to put this message out there and help more and more people. Can you imagine a world of people who know that they're divine? A world of people who recognize that 
I, I don't believe that you can accept your divinity and then agree with the oppression of another person. So this is very much about me reaching for my utopian world where it's a world that works for everyone. The scripture that has been guiding this series and what this whole walk through your faith is your fortune is about is Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. The part of the scripture we're going to be working with tonight is the belief that you have received it. That's what this lesson is about tonight. It's that little piece where it says, believe that you have received it. We're going to talk about what to do when you stop believing and how to get back to belief. And so let's just take a moment to just bless this time that we have together. I know that God has something so special for us in our time together, and I'm excited to just partake in that. I'm so grateful for this platform. I thank God for this ministry going all over the world and being a blessing to so many people that men and women will hear this lesson and that it will impact them in a way that, that lifts them out of where they are. I see people coming out of addiction. I see people coming out of bad relationships. I see people coming out of limited job situations. I see people walking in their purpose because of what they receive here today. And I thank you, God. I thank you because I know that there's not something that I can personally do that I know that it is the working of the whole spirit of God through me to impact humanity. And so I open my heart and my mind for that. I open my spirit for that and I allow it to be so. And I trust that it can be so in the name and nature of Jesus. That's how I let it be. Let's dig in. Let's get some of this good old Bible. Hey. Hey, hey, I got a couple comments. Oh, Constance, she said, thank God for you. Thank God for you, Constance. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. How many times must you resurrect your dreams? As many times as it takes. But here's the thing. You will have to resurrect your dreams, period. Even when you're walking in your purpose and you're in the zone and you're hitting all of your markers, you still will have to resurrect your dreams. And if you talk to any person who is living their dream life, I don't care who it is, you're going to find somebody who had to resurrect their dream many times before they could enjoy the life that they live right now. And so if whatever it is that you're going for, it's like make peace with that. Make peace with having to resurrect your dream. Just get clear with it. The, um, I had the, the, the privilege of producing Ava DuVernay's uh, short film, Saturday Night Life. Oh, my light went off. Okay, hold on for a second. Let me see if I can do something about that. Oops. Maybe I'll stop the recording and see if that pause. So how many times must you resurrect your dreams? As many times as it takes. I was sharing the story that I got the, had the privilege of producing Ava DuVernay's short film, Saturday Night Life. And this film is a beautiful film. It is about a mother single mother with three children who doesn't really have enough money to support her children. And one of the things that she does to entertain them is that they go through the, they go shopping on Saturday, Saturday night at the grocery store and they're shopping, but they never buy anything. And, and that's one of the reveals in the film. At the time, Ava was a full-time publicist. She was a rock star publicist with her own agency, the DuVernay agency. She had many clients uh, with the studios and was hired to work on many high profile pictures. And she got interested in directing and it wasn't something that she really publicized. A few people knew. When I came into her experience with working with her on this film, she had just completed a two year program quietly to develop herself as a director. And this short film, she, before she had done this short film, she had written the script for In the Middle of Nowhere, which has since been produced. She had written the script for In the Middle of Nowhere. She had given it to friends to, you know, give notes on people that she was in contact with because of her work professionally as a publicist. And she really didn't get any traction on it. She had done a documentary on women in rap. I think my mic sounds nice. I remember it involved MC Light and a couple of other people but nothing was really happening. And she really hoped that that year that in the middle of nowhere would have been made. 
And it was really frustrating for her because she is a woman of action. She gets things done. The powerhouse that she is today is no secret because it's she was a powerhouse back then. But she couldn't get any traction on this. And she decided, let me do what I can. And so she took her own personal money and paid to produce a short film called Saturday Night Life. And I worked with her producing that film. And as I was putting this lesson together, I started reflecting on that moment because I've, I learned so many lessons just observing her and working with her and really got that you, even when you are rocking and rolling and, and she was in a position, an enviable position as a publicist and for the clients that she had and the type of projects that she got put on or invited to be a part of or got to bid on. But her dream was to be a director and her dream was to create content. And when she is sitting in this space and the train is moving full speed in another, in another direction, in the direction of publicity and wanting to be going in another completely opposite direction and feeling like, will I ever be able to get off this train? I have built up this business. Who will I leave the business to? How will I exit the business? How will I do this and begin to live in accord with what feels true to me, which is being a director. And what I appreciate or what I learned observing her was just that you do what you can, where you can. And she was willing to bet on herself and took her own money and put it into a short film that then became one of the a winner for um, Showtime's Black Filmmaker Showcase and went on to festivals and began to open doors for her. But sitting in the space where she was sitting on at that day in the early 2000s, there's no way that you could have seen the Ava who had created Queen Sugar. I don't even know if she was aware of the book Queen Sugar at that point that then became the property that got turned into the television show or knowing that she would end up on the project Selma or A Wrinkle in Time or, may, or many of the other things. It was in that moment that she had to resurrect that dream, that she had to believe in something bigger than herself and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And sometimes what happens to us is that we, we get a no and then we stop. We stop taking action. But the universe only asks for us to do what it is that we can. Do what you can today. That's all you can do. You can't do any more than what you can do today, given your skill set, your resources. But do all that you can today. And that's what she was able, that's what I saw her do and experience her doing and had the, the opportunity to work with her, which was to take my own money and put it into this short film. I'm going to bet on me. So you can resurrect your dreams and anyone who has gotten to any level of extraordinary living where hmm, she's now BFFs with Oprah, which I love that. The, anyone who's living any level of extraordinary will tell you that there were many times along the way where they had to resurrect their dreams. So what I'm going to share with you tonight, and we're going to use uh, metaphysical interpretation applied to the Elijah story with the widow to just tease out an understanding of, uh, how to resurrect those dreams. And if you familiarize yourself with this process and really memorize this process, then you will be able to get back up again and again and again and again and again. So that's where we're going tonight. So I should probably read the story first. Maybe I should do that. Um, it's found in, if you want to look it up with me, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 17 to 24. And I'm going to read from the uh, New Revised Standard Version. The New Revised Standard Version. If it comes up, where are you at? Where are you at, New Revised? First Kings 17, verses 17 to 24. So this is what it says. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring me, bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord. 
Oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. Then the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, see, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So that's the story that this woman's son gets sick while Elijah is in the house. The woman is distraught. Elijah takes the child, takes the child into the upper room where he had been staying, prays over him, calls on the spirit of God to revive this child. God revives the child. And then he takes him back downstairs to his mother and says, see, your son is alive. So that's the story. So the question, Ray, that you asked was about metaphysical versus psychological interpretation. And they essentially, you can consider them synonymous. Neville talks about the Bible being a psychological drama that you are, when you are reading the stories, you're not reading historical fact that what you are reading are interactions that have lessons that do not depend on whether or not the stories are factually true. And what Neville is saying is that none of the stories are factually true that all of the stories are one big psychological drama to communicate spiritual principle to you. And that if you go to the Bible, reading the Bible for historical fact, and then you begin to base your faith on that, one, you're in error, but two, it doesn't get you what it is that you need, which are the lessons that allow you to stand in the face of any storm. Metaphysical interpretation comes out of this belief that you are each person in the Bible. So you're Elijah, you're the widow, you're the child. Whenever you're reading the characters or a story, we tend to read a story and we identify with one character in the story, but in actuality, we've each been the widow, we've each been the child, we've each been Elijah. So when you're reading it, it's almost like you're reading these interlocking parts that tell you about a process that's happening inside of you. There's not enough material difference between what Neville calls the psychological interpretation and what we in New, in, uh, New Thought and specifically in the UFBL and Unity call the metaphysical interpretation to say that there's any real difference. So, Ray, you really can consider those synonymous. The basics of metaphysical interpretation is that every element of a story symbolizes something. And the way that they determine how, what something symbolizes is that they go back to the original definition of the Hebrew or the Greek word in the scripture. And then they look at how it functions in the story. So they'll say, okay, what does the name Elijah mean? And how is Elijah functioning in this story? And that's how the metaphysical inter, uh, definition is uh, developed. Then what happens is that you, there's a meta, I don't think I have it upstairs. Um, this huge dot. Yeah, mine is downstairs. The metaphysical Bible dictionary. So when you're doing metaphysical Bible interpretation, what you do is you go and you look up the, the key words in scripture. So in this, you be the Elijah, child, widow, bed, upper room, uh, door. You look up the, like the key words in the scripture, and then you would substitute those definitions into the scripture, and then write it out with the definitions now substituted in and and then you keep working with it until you get kind of a quasi clear sentence a set of sentences and then you begin to let the meaning emerge from for you there's no single meaning so you're never going to go to a metaphysical church and they're going to say this is the definitive metaphysical meaning there's no such thing because spirit is always speaking and so what spirit has to say today might not be what spirit has, has to say tomorrow to the same person, let alone somebody different sitting with the scripture. So what I'm sharing with you is one metaphysical interpretation of this particular story on how do you resurrect your dreams. I've got a comment. Ray says, thanks. It was my feeling that they were very similar. Yes. Yes. 
there's not enough difference that I see in terms of what I've read um, to see an, a difference and to say that it's a material difference. You can consider them synonymous. So the first uh, step in this process is to take the child from the widow. Take the child from the widow. That's what, that's what Elijah does. It says, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. The mama is freaking out. And Elijah's like, give me the child. <laughs> so the widow represents a state of consciousness where you feel profound loss, where it feels like your good is just gone. Children always represent new ideas. And in this instance, Neville uh, talks about the child representing a uh, frustrated desire, frustrated ambition. Uh, incidentally, this is when you see children being taken from parents in scripture, this is what is so significant of the story of Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac or the woman with the oil uh, worried that the creditors are going to take her sons, that children represented your future, especially for women. If you were a widow, you didn't have a husband to take care of you, but perhaps your children would take care of you. And so then to lose your child is to lose your future. The Elijah in this story functions like the I am. And so what is happening in this story is that you're watching the I am separate the dead child or the frustrated desire from the feeling of failure, from the feeling of having no future. And this is what we must do, that we have to begin to separate our dreams that have not manifested, the dreams that we're frustrated about, to begin to separate the, the act of failing from the feeling of failure. Just because you fail doesn't mean you have to feel like a failure. But often what keeps us in a limited state and what keeps the dream from resurrecting is that we don't have the ability emotionally or the spiritual maturity to separate the two. And so the first act is the most important act, which is to take the child from the widow, to begin to divorce that feeling of failure from the, from the actual failure itself, to begin to pull off those feelings and get rid of those feelings. We can't do greater than how we see ourselves. And so the problem with feeling like a failure is that it compromises our, our ability to take positive, definite action in the future. Because the feeling is that I'm a failure. And if I feel like I'm a failure, then doing things that winners do never even comes into my awareness because I feel like a failure. And so that first step, now I wanna talk about what can make you, what can help you do that. You can do that with music. One of my favorite songs, I've shared it with you guys before, and then I got flagged by YouTube for playing it <laughs> because I don't own the copyright to it, is The Champion by Carrie Underwood. I love that song. That is one of those songs that if you're in a funky mood and you're feeling like, God, I have let myself down, I've let my family down, everything is just going to hell in a handbasket, this dream is never going to happen, put that song on. I am the champion. I'm invincible, unstoppable, unbreakable, unshakable. They knock me down, I get up again. And I love Ludacris's rapping man. The C is for the courage that I possess through the drama. The H is for the hurt, but it's all for the honor. The A is for the attitude, working through the patience. Money comes and goes, so the M is for motivation. The I is, uh, the, uh, gotta stay consistent, so the P is for persevere. The I is for integrity, innovative career. The O is optimistic, open and never shut, and the N is necessary, because I'm never giving up. They asked me why I did it, I did it. <laughs> Oh, wait. They asked me how I did it. I did it from the heart, been crushing the competition, been doing it from the start. They say that every champion is all about his principles. Sherry, come on. So you can use music to take the child from the widow. You can use movement. There is something sacred about the about movement. And so just getting up and dancing and, and it's you begin to shake that energy. This is, so when we're taking the child from the widow, we're bringing all of our 
senses to bear to just separate that. Because when you're singing, I am the champion, they knock me down, I get up again, I'll put, your, put you flat on your back like Ali. You can't sit in that space of, oh, woe is me. So you can use music to take the child from the widow. You can use affirmation. This is something I used to do uh, back in 2000, still do it a little bit, but not as much. But in 2010, 2011, 2012, I was working in a, a job that felt like a dead end job. And it was, I couldn't believe I was there. <laughs> I just could not believe I was there. It felt like whose life is this? And the only thing that I had was I, I, I love to write. And so I would sit and I would write affirmations that, that I am successful and I am, like I would just write affirmations over and over again. I wouldn't talk to any of my coworkers because I ain't trying to be y'all friend because y'all might keep me here in this job. <laughs> just, <laughs> you gotta take the child from the widow in whatever way you can. So music will help you do that. Writing will help you do that. Dance will help you do that. Praise and worship will help you do that. Again, what you're doing is you're separating feeling, separating the act of failure from the feeling of failure. Does that make sense? Ray says it is also my understanding that it is important to recognize what these Bible lessons mean to you personally. Yes. Yvonne says movement helps you release trauma, which gets stuck in your body. Yes, 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 yes. So those are some of the tools that you can use. And again, these are just the ones that I'm aware of. There may be some things that you're aware of, but again, what helps you separate the act from the feeling? Separate the act from the feeling. Just pull them apart. Step two, carry the child to the upper room. Carry the child to the upper room. The scripture, 1 Kings 17, 19, Elijah carried him into the upper room where he was lodging. The upper chamber, this definition is from the revealing word, symbolizes a higher state of consciousness attained through prayer or by going into the silence. It is the high state of mind that we assume in thinking about spiritual things. Again, going into that upper room, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're raising in consciousness. You're raising in consciousness. So that might be, you, you might use prayer to get into the upper room. Um, but when you pray, you want to pray from a higher state of consciousness, meaning that you want to pray from the finished work. So going back to Ava, just using that as an example. So I don't know if she could have pictured the way life looks right now, but certainly she pictured being able to um, see in the middle of nowhere turned into a feature film and see herself presenting the film at film festivals and sharing it with audiences. So when she's sitting in this space where she's got a thriving business, but it's not where her heart is and it's not what she wants to be doing, that it's to begin to, to shift that energy to, to, in her mind to go to that place where in the middle of nowhere is a finished work, is a finished product. And, and to stay in that space and then begin to pray. That's a very different prayer because now it's finished. And so then the prayer is about Thanksgiving. The prayer is about praise. The prayer is about congratulations, Ava, that you didn't give up. It, it's, it's a different level of recognition. It's you, you, when you want to locate yourself in your dream, but you want to locate yourself at the end of your dream finished so that, that you're in this space where it's already done in your mind because your mind doesn't know that it's real or not real. Your mind doesn't know that you're in, envisioning it. Your mind has no awareness that you're envisioning it. It believes that it is so. Ray says, I think what I was trying to say was how does this lesson relate to my personal experience? How do I get into my upper room consciousness and live my dreams? Yes. So I don't know what the end, we haven't talked in a while, Ray, so I don't know what, the, what new dreams you have, but certainly in terms of, of writing and publishing, it's seeing yourself presenting your books at a book conference. It's seeing... Uh, your book written up in the newspaper. And then when you pray, it's as if this has already happened and you're praying from the vantage point of someone whose books are already published, already out in the marketplace. So because what you're doing is you're carrying the child, you're taking the frustrated dream and desire into the upper room. You're taking it into that, that higher state of consciousness. And let's talk about why you do that. 
The thinking that produced the frustrated dream is not the thinking that can produce the manifested dream. The thinking that got you to where you are is not the thinking that can take you to where you want to be. Because the thinking that got you to where you are got you to where you are. <laughs> Give thanks for it, but it got you to where you are and it cannot take you to where you want to go. In order to get to that higher state of consciousness, you're going to have to come up a little higher. You're going to have to get some new ideas. Got it. Okay, great. He says, you got it. Thanks. Jordan, you got to hang on, babe. Yes. Yes. Go ask Mike for it. It's downstairs. When you pray from a higher state of consciousness, when you pray from the consciousness of it's already done, you, you open a pathway for new ideas to come into your experience. You open a new, an avenue for new ideas, an avenue for a higher level of thinking to come into your experience. It can't get there when you are mentally located in the frustrated dream. You're going to have to mentally locate yourself in a higher state of consciousness. Step number three, close the door, close the door. Now, what's interesting, I left this here because Neville talked about it. It's actually not in the scripture. Close the door is not in the scripture, but I wanted to include it here because it, it's such an important step that even if it's not in scripture, even if it's not in scripture, it's implied. As he entered this upper room, he closed the door. The door of our mind is I am. Everything that comes into your life walks through the door of I am. Every experience in your life walks through the door of I am. You, whether you clearly articulate I am, whatever has appeared in your life, or whether it's just been in your demeanor and you've behaved as if I am. So I am is it, it's the, the door through which whatever you have ha right now has come into your experience, which means that the door was opened or closed on your word. The door was opened or closed on your word. So the, the importance of closing the door is that you close the door with your words. And if you think about this, this is how you open and close doors in your life. If you go into your job and you're grumpy and you've got a bad attitude and you're walking in just waiting for somebody to say something crosswise, you know, catch you crosswise, that, 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 those words that you have running in your head before you walk in the door of your job are basically opening the door for certain things into, into your experience. And so our words Mommy, literally, I maybe you can't have, interrupt. You can't interrupt. No, 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 no. Do you have more juice? I don't have more juice, but you can ask Mike for apple juice, okay? Okay. Go ahead. Our words literally become, they either, they build a fence around us. And so when you get the child from the widow, when you have gotten into that, space where you you're in the upper room then you want to begin to speak the word like a that builds like a fortress around you oprah talked about this when she would go to interview people on death row she would literally sit and begin to speak the word for white light all around her because wherever you go you're touched by whatever you touch wherever you go you're touched by whatever you touch and this happens with, with, in medicine, this happens everywhere. You see doctors who studied a particular disease over a period of time and then contracted the very disease that they were studying because you, whatever you touch, touches you. Now, what you have to begin to do is to insulate yourself and your word is how you insulate yourself. 
And so you just begin to speak the word. It literally builds a fence around you. And I, I put some things in the blog post that every dream God gives me has the power to live fully. The mere fact that I have a dream proves my ability to realize it. The wonder working power of God makes my dream a reality now. Nothing and no one can keep me from my good. And you just begin to speak the word. You begin to speak the word and it forms an impenetrable fence around you through which nothing but that which matches what is what the fence is made up of can get through. And so Ray, in your case with the books is that as you take that dream into the upper room, as you remove it from the widow, as you separate it from whatever feelings of frustration you have about it not yet being manifested, then you begin to speak the word to protect the space that, that this dream is real, that, that, that God needs me to write, that he gave me the vision to write, that he needs me to write. And right now I'm being fortified with everything that I need in order to get these books out of me and into expression. I'm no longer talking about it. I'm actually doing it. I'm living it. And you just begin to build that fence, right? You begin to build a fence of affirmation. Neville talks about it as a door. But what ends up happening is that as you build that fence, you close out the opportunity for anything unlike it. And so doubt can't get in because I've built a door that doubt can't get through. Fear can't get in because with my words, I've built a door that fear cannot get through. Joe says, got it. Okay, got it. Good. Step four, place the child upon the bed. First King 17, 19, Elijah laid him on his own bed. A bed symbolizes a place of rest. Elijah in this story represents I am. So we're talking about the place that I am rests, which is in the state of pure potentiality where all possibilities are true. That I am, this is your unconditioned awareness of being. It has not yet been formed into anything, but it has the ability to become anything and everything. And so placing the dream on the bed is placing the child in that space of pure potentiality. That space where I don't know how, but I know that it can be done. And it's a, it's a space of peace, you know, a bed when you ideally your bed is a, a place where you can rest and and be restored and renewed and that it's it is a space of peace and so what this state feels like for you is just a state of peace about your dream it, it's letting go of of the question of will it happen for me or will i ever be able to get past this moment that i am i'm in that space where i've already overcome every obstacle that this is already a global ministry, that this is already blessing men and women all over the world. This is already doing good work all over the world. And I'm sitting in that space of peace. I'm sitting in that space of complete and total peace. No hurt or harm can come to me. No hurt or harm can come from me. And I'm in this space where every possibility is true. Every possibility is true. Whatever I can dream of is true. And in this space, the question of whether or not your dream can happen is just dissolved. It's not a question because it, it's happening. I'm, I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing it. I'm in that space of complete peace. So step four is really about relaxation. It's about holding your dream in front of you and then relaxing. Letting go of all tension around the dream. You know, you've, you've shaken the energy up. You took the child from the widow. You got into the upper room. You closed the door. You built this impenetrable fence around. This dream is happening. This dream is mine. God gave it to me, so it's got to be so. And then you just begin to rest in that state of peace. Just to just breathe. 
as you see images of the dream, whatever snippets, whatever you have, and it's just a state of peace. Just a state of peace. I've got some comments. Joe says, so this can be actual physical healing also if this is my dream. Yes. 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 You can see the body disease-free. You can see, the, it, 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 again, you take the, the dream of a healthy body, right? That's the, that's the frustrated desire. You take that into the upper room. It's separated. You, you have let go of the feeling of illness from the fact, the act of illness. And I'm taking it into the upper room and I begin to build a fence. God is my help. I cannot be sick. Only the light and the love of the Christ get to flow through this body. The love of God now restores my body. I'm in a healing space. And you just begin to build the fence, close the door. Close the door to anything that, because what's happening when he closes the door is that he is withdrawing his attention from the widow and from anything else that suggests that this child cannot be restored to life. As long as he was down with the widow, he's caught up in her worry. It's like, I can't roll with you in your worry. I, I got to get into the upper room. Your worry will keep the child dead. So closing the door is closing the door to worry. It's closing the door to fear because the widow fears, the widow is staring at a dead future and feels like, I don't, I'm not going to be able to take care of myself. I don't have any children. I'm a woman. What am I going? But again, th that fear, when you take the frustrated desire from the widow and move into the upper room and then begin to close the door with the right words, then you relax into that state of peace. and begin to breathe and let, and let all the tension flow out of your shoulders, out of your brow, wherever the tension is held in your jaw and your hips and your legs and your thighs and your feet. Sometimes people sit with their toes curled up is to let that out wherever it is. This is placing the child upon the bed. It's moving into that state of peace. And then step five, Breathe life into the child. Now, I think, so first of all, there's a couple things. One is that he did it three times, which means that it might take you more than one time to breathe life into that child. But what it means to breathe life into the child is to see it in vivid detail with as much sensory vividness as you possibly can. And so <clears throat> since you brought up physical healing, to breathe life into the child is to, is to go to that space in consciousness where the body is disease free. There is no illness. There is no illness. And so you, you, this is where you employ your imagination. When you're breathing life into something, what you're doing is you're looking upon the stage of your imagination and you're seeing it in the ideal state. And so you are seeing the child, the dream, the desire realized. And then you begin to get a feel for its texture, its taste, its sound, its smell, what it looks like, right? So you, and, and you, you begin to bring all five senses to bear. Now, this doesn't have to be an elaborate thing, meaning some people can visualize and they can see a whole race. I think that's great. I'm not that person. And you don't need the whole picture. You just need the key moments that make the subconscious mind believe the picture. And so something simple for me, I've shared the story with you of going through the process of, of potentially losing my house and worried about whether or not that was going to happen. And I would sit in my prayer closet and I would just hear my mom tell me, congratulations, Sherry, you did it. You pulled it out. And that was the only thing that I could, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't, I mean, I had built a vision board and it was hanging on the wall. So I did do a vision board, but what, what I would hear for, what I would listen for is I would listen to my mom saying, congratulations, Sherry, you pulled it out. 
And I would just hear that. And that's what would be in my prayer time. But again, you're breathing life into it. You're standing the dream on its feet. And again, it is significant that he said he did this three times because the first time you try to do it or the third time you try to do it, it might be hard breathing life into it. It may take you multiple attempts to see the dream. It might take you multiple attempts to hear the dream. It might take you multiple attempts to make it real for you. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Even the little bit that you do, which you barely believe in, is doing something for the subconscious mind. Do it anyway. And so to breathe life into the child is to use your imagination to put the dream on its feet. Use your imagination to put the dream on its feet. Constance says, can you then use treasure mapping vision boards for that? I think so. I think so. I, I, I shouldn't even say I think so. I know you can. I think vision boards and treasure mapping, I think that you absolutely should use that. You should use whatever is going to make it feel real for you. There's a speaker that I heard a couple of weeks ago. His name is Ed Milet, and you may want to look him up, Ed Milet, M-Y-L-E-T-T. -T. And he said a phrase that I thought was powerful. He said, touch the dream. And what he meant by that is that go and put yourself in the dream, whatever it is. And in this case, he wanted to live in Beverly Hills. And so he and his wife, as they were struggling, when he would hit a goal, he would reward himself by going and dining in Beverly Hills or just walk, or driving around and looking at the houses in Beverly Hills. I did that to manifest the car that I now have. I would go and test drive the car. I had no means and no consciousness of how that car was going to end up being mine. And I would just go and test drive the car. And I was young enough to not care what anybody thought. And I would just go and hand in my license and test drive the car. And through a series of events that in a way that I couldn't have imagined, that car ended up being mine without me having to pay for it, period. Brand new. Like nobody ever drove it but me. So it, the, it's this breathing life. There are many ways to breathe life into the child. But all of it involves engaging the senses and making it as real as possible for you, where it feels actual even in the even though it has not physically manifested it feels actual for you step six return the child to the mother return the child to the mother and you would say why would i give it back to the mama in scripture women represent the feeling nature and you know reverend ike talks about the feeling gets the blessing that, that you have to give the resurrected child back to the feeling nature. Once you have put life into it, it is through the subconscious phase of mind that, that your dream becomes a reality. And so it's going to come through the mother. The, the realization of the dream is going to come through that subjective phase of mind. And so what you want to do is to give it all the sensory vividness and then give it back to the mom. But you're not giving it back to the mom. And I think that it's key that he calls her the widow in the beginning of the story, but the mother at the end of the story, because she shifted consciousness. She's no longer in that space of worry and despair and feeling like her future is dead. And so she's, she's no longer acting like the widow, that he gives a child back to the mother. It, it's when you've done the work in the upper room, it's going back to your daily life as if the dream is already manifest. And we carry this feeling of a fully alive child into our daily living. She says in verse 24 to him, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth, that her belief has been established. That what, that what happens in this process when you are resurrecting the dream is that you are, you are restoring belief in the dream. And so when you hand the dream back to the mother, you're handing the dream back to a consciousness that believes that it can be so. And so the dominant feeling in this step 
is, is a sense of expectancy. Hang on, Jordan. It, not yet. It is, it is, it is a feeling of expectancy where we expect our dreams and our ambitions to manifest. And then step seven, declare that your child lives. The scripture, uh, verse 23 says, then Elijah said, see, your son is alive. In the upper room, you restored the life in your dreams, the feeling of possibility. Then from this point forward, let every word you speak from this moment be an affirmation that what you want is so. And so I am, which is what Elijah is symbolizing in the story, is declaring to the, feel, the, the feeling nature, your dream lives. Your dream lives. And the feeling nature will accept this statement as irrefutable proof that the dream has been revived. And so it, it, your, your speech changes. This is what's happening through this process is that your speech begins to shift. Uh, you, you, you talk about what it is that you want as if it is so. You, you talk about your dreams as, as, as if they are manifest. And, and it, it's not a question of if, it's now just a matter of when. When I have the car, when I'm in this house, when these books get published, when this body is disease free, you're in that space of when it's no longer if it's no longer guesswork. Ray says, "Wow, very powerful lesson tonight. I'm feeling it. Good, yay! Thank God." So this is the this is these steps is really to familiarize yourself with these steps because. You will do this over and over and over and over again. You might do it every day. It might have to become your morning routine where you get the child from the widow because you might wake up in the widow state of consciousness. You might wake up in that, in that feeling that ain't nothing working out for me. And you're going to have to pick up the child and take the child from the widow before you get going to work. You have to carry the child into the upper room, close the door, put the child on the bed, breathe life into the child, give the child back to the mama. The child lives and the child might die every night. But listen, he won't die as much the next night. And you just keep doing it. If you talk to anybody who has made it, anybody, Ava, which is someone I have a personal example with, but if you look at anybody that you admire, Oprah, there's a powerful talk that she gives. Uh, it's from the Essence, it might be this year's Essence Fest, where she talks about starting her own network and then admitting that she's like, I didn't know what I was doing. I, if I had known how much work it was going to be, I never would have done that. And, and then having to make that dream live. It, you can resurrect your dreams. You have to resurrect your dreams. There is a level of extraordinary that wants to be lived through you. You are extraordinary. Make no mistake about it. No matter how you feel, you are extraordinary. You are gifted. You are talented. You have the life of God expressing through you. God doesn't do anything small anywhere. Look at the Pacific Ocean. Look at the rivers. <laughs> Even the rivers are magnificent. Look at the mountains. There's nothing that God does in a tiny way. Even when he makes a fruit fly, he makes billions of them. I mean, seriously, God has always teamed too much <laughs> on some of this stuff. If you look at the moth, which he could have made 10, and that would have, for me, that would have been enough for the planet. And yet there are 11,000 different species, known species of moths. There are 20,000 known species of bee, 23,000 known species of trees, known, not 23, I mean, that's not enough, but still 23,000 trees, but 23,000 known species of trees. God does not do anything in a small way. And so when you're talking about letting the spirit of God flow through, you're talking about an extraordinary life. There's no two ways about it. And so this process is about resurrecting so that you can continue to stand up and be the vessel through which the extraordinary can have expression. You want to be the vessel through which the extraordinary can have expression. And if you're going to be that person, 
then you're gonna need to learn how to get up off the mat. You're gonna need to learn how to resurrect the dream, how to come out of the frustration and the disappointment and the letdowns. Life is full of letdowns, full of opportunities and chances for you to resurrect your dream. Don't worry, if you haven't had a chance, one is coming. Very Mary used to say, uh, you can be at the beach, don't worry, a wave is coming. If you haven't seen one, don't even stress, it's on its way. <laughs> the, the, and a wave to knock you down. It's the same thing, don't worry. The setback is coming, the stress is coming. It's, it's part of the process of you proving that you want what you want and that you're really serious about it. So, can you make this process your go-to technique for breathing life into your dreams? This is, if you memorize it, just get that story and read that story of Elijah over and over again. Take the child from the widow. That might be where you need to just rest right there. Just take the child from the widow. Every morning I get up and take the child from the widow. I put on a good song and, and rip that baby from that mama's arms because she cannot have him. Right now, right now, not in that state of mind. I got to go do something with this child so that she can, I can give her back to you. Can you make this process your go-to technique for breathing life into your dreams? And then before you move to your next task, choose a dream to apply this technique to. You don't even have to believe that what I'm telling you is true. You can work on it and make it true for yourself or prove that I'm telling a story and then journal about your results. So the question is, what are you gonna work on? I know for me, because I'm working on a new car, and I've been frustrated with how slow this process has been with manifesting the car, is that I'm a, the child that I need to take from the widow is my new car. That, that, that's what I need to snatch out of the hands of the widow. If this webinar helps you, please subscribe and please tell a friend about it. I hope this has been a blessing for you. Mulela says, why was he stretching? I think that's a very good question. I hadn't thought about that. I had not thought about that. But let's sit with this for a second because everything symbolizes something. Well, one, he's stretching over the child, right? He's stretching over him. And I feel like that that stretching symbolizes a couple things. One, that it, he's covering him in his energy. Because he's he represents I am and he represents belief in all possibility. He represents the unconditioned awareness. And so stretching himself over the child is to cover the child with his essence. But there's also something, um, I, and Yvonne, you said it earlier about movement. Um can I that, the iPad downstairs? Yes, baby, you can take the iPad downstairs. Um, where is that, Yvonne? I'm looking for your comment. She said with movement, uh, maybe I've lost it. Ah, she says movement helps you release trauma, which gets stuck in your body. Somebody raised their hand. Uh, I don't know how to let your hand come up, but you can do that. All right. You can unmute yourself. I don't know how to unmute you. No, I will figure it out. Hi. Hi. Hey, here. Hey. This is Alita. Oh, hey, Alita. Uh, I thought of the stretching as like a growth, like mm -hmm. a growth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like that. And, and then you, you, you can't really do anything unless you're growing. Uh, my neighbor always says, onward, upward and onward. Mm-hmm. And so it's, that's just how I think about the stretching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Um, uh, Yvonne said something. She said movement helps you to release trauma, which gets stuck in your body. And, and so that may be right in alignment with what you're talking about, Alita, which is that, that there's this letting go process when you stretch, when you, just, when you open up and it's like, I'm, 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 I'm allowing this to be. I'm allowing this to, to, to take uh, expression. Um, <laughs> Milayla says, I was about to say what she said. There you go. Kansa says, it is done, it is done, it is done. I talk about because it is done. Yes, 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 yes. It is done. 
Oh, thank you. Constance says, I'm sharing this tonight. This is a wonderful lesson that I think may assist someone to think a new thought. Let's hope. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you guys. Next week, Daniel and the Lion's Den. And you know this is going to be a good one because you know this is about making the lions your friend, being in the midst of having to almost have your head ripped off by a lion and turning it around. <laughs> so this is going to be a good one. Daniel and the Lion's Den, page 124 to 128. I already know it's going to be fire. Uh, next week, I will be broadcasting from Kansas City, Missouri. I am going to be in Unity Village. Very excited. I'll be there speaking as a part of the Fillmore Festival. I am the keynote for Saturday night. I'll be closing the festival out. And I am working on a very special worship experience for that Saturday night. So if you are in the Midwest and you can get over to Unity Village, come on over and hang with me at Unity Village that night. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. God bless.